Hi everyone, my name is Rosalina Jowers and I'm the Senior Manager of Comms at Participant, the leading media company dedicated to entertainment that inspires audiences to engage in positive social change. Today we'll be hearing from my colleague Hoda Hawa as well as our partners Frederica Newton, Marshall Hatch Jr. and Dr. Jacqueline Lazou about our impact campaign around the Oscar winning film Judas and the Black Messiah. If you haven't already, make sure to check out the summit website to view your free screening of the film. The screening is available throughout the end of the summit to a limited number of viewers, so secure your link soon. For those of you who may not be familiar with Participant, I think you might be familiar with our work. You're not a viewer. You are not an audience member. This is a film about you. You're in every scene. You are a participant. These are your tears. This is your strength. Get in trouble! Good trouble! Necessary trouble! Oh, that's a third degree Ginsburg! This is your joy. Your journey. You can't turn it off. There will be no end credits. There is a moment when you have to choose whether to be silent or to stand up. So don't act like you don't have a voice. It takes courage to change people's hearts. Don't act like you need permission. It is right to give hope to the future generation. Just act. Our company was founded in 2004 by Jeff School based on a simple belief that a good story well told can change the world. And since then, our work has centered on a union of art and activism, a combination that has proven to be uniquely powerful in driving change. Storytelling is at the heart of what we do. Created by a diverse range of artists, our stories highlight everyday people who have the courage to stand up and speak truth to power. Through our impact campaigns, we connect our artist stories to the activists who are leading the change on today's most pressing issues. And this panel is one example of that work. So the most recent example of how we approach our work is our impact campaign around Judas and the Black Messiah, which we launched around the film's release in February. All of our panelists today will be able to speak to the incredible opportunity that the film presented to change the narrative around the Black Panther's positive and longstanding impact. But before we get started, just a refresher, here is the trailer to the film. Deputy Chairman Fred Hampton of the Illinois Black Panther Party. Repeat after me. Looking at 18 months for the stolen car, five years for impersonating a federal officer, or you can go home. The Black Panthers are forming a rainbow coalition of oppressed brothers and sisters of every color. The 
their aim is to sow hatred and inspire terror. I will learn all that I can. I These ain't no terrorists. You can murder a liberator, but you can't murder a liberation. You can murder a revolutionary, but you can't murder a revolution. And you can murder a freedom fighter, but you can't murder freedom. And now I'd like to introduce each of our amazing panelists. First is Hoda Hawa, as I mentioned, who is my colleague at Participant. She is the Social Impact Senior Manager and Impact Producer for our team. Marshall Hatch Jr. is the Co-Founder and Executive Director of the Mafia Redemption Project in Chicago. Frederica Newton is the President and Co-Founder of the Dr. Huey P. Newton Foundation. Dr. Jacqueline Lazou is the Associate Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and Associate Professor of the Department of Modern Languages, Critical Ethnic Studies and Criminology at DePaul University. Hi, everyone. Um, we're super excited to get started. So the first question is for my colleague, Hoda. You've been leading participants' impact campaign work tied to the film, and we're just curious to hear how did participant approach building a campaign around such a largely misunderstood um, subject. Thank you, Rosalina. I think you hit the nail on the head in your introduction when you said that we are a company that largely relies on our partnerships with leaders and experts in communities who have been doing the work. And so with this incredible content that we have through Judas and the Black Messiah, we really sought to uh, educate audiences on the accurate and nuanced history of the Black Panther Party. And so what we did early on, um, sort of as we were designing and putting together the campaign is we embarked on a listening tour, if you will, and sort of went to the leading folks in communities, those who have really centered their lives, their work around the issues that the Black Panthers were fighting for, um, who were themselves connected to the Black Panther Party, and really sought to understand and listen to how our campaign can be an additive resource, can help to amplify the work that is already being done. And so I think we have today an incredible panel um, and a group of folks here that have already been doing the work, who I know will continue to do the work. And this campaign is really just um, uh, an additive way to highlight the work that's being done because we have such an incredible piece of content through the film. We have, uh, we have now a national focus of people who have seen the film, who have now heard of the idea of the Black Panther Party, the work that they did. Uh, and now we have an energized audience who want to take part in continuing the legacy of the work of the Black Panther Party. Oh, no, that's exactly right. And I think even though we don't have the filmmakers here with us today, all of the filmmakers were so integral to our process and being able to build this campaign, as well as make sure that we stayed true to the story and the legacy of Chairman Hampton. And obviously Chairman Hampton Jr. in Chicago was also a, such a large part of that work. So I definitely wanna recognize him and Mother Akua here as well. Um, Hoda, as a follow up to that, though, what were some of the goals of the campaign if you get to like a little bit of the nitty gritty? And how did our partnership with Marshall, Frederick and Dr. Lazu help us achieve some of them? And where are we going next? Yeah, absolutely. So early on, we had such an incredible momentum and opportunity around the release of the film early in February. Um, and so in that first phase of the campaign, we really sought to work with our partners. We worked with um, our distributors at Warner Brothers to uh, to amplify, again, the story, just to, to, to elevate it to the national conversation. Um, for folks who hadn't heard of the Black Panther Party before and their work, we use the opportunity through the film to begin that conversation. For those who had heard of the Black Panther Party, oftentimes it was taught through a very narrow lens and taught through an inaccurate and negative lens. And so we sought to um, sort of re-educate that audience on really what the Black Panther 
Panthers were trying to do to build their communities to ensure that resources were brought to their communities. And so we worked closely with Marshall, Dr. Lazou, and Frederica to bring those conversations to communities. And so we would host various events like screenings and panel discussions to really hone in on what those specific community concerns and more importantly, their opportunities through elevating the legacy of the Panthers could do for that community. Now we're focusing on really diving deep in that education and ensuring that this history is taught in classrooms and communities. I think for so often this, this history has not only been overlooked, but erased. And I think as we look through, we look at the continuum of um, black liberation leaders in this country, we need to make sure that this history is a part of that storytelling. Um, and so now we have this incredible education guide, which each of our partners here have been instrumental in putting together. And we're hoping to get that education guide into communities and in classrooms to ensure that folks have that history. And we'll be coming back to that guide a little bit later in the conversation. But you mentioned, obviously, the importance of really showing to light the, the history that's been erased. And I think that's the perfect segue to our next question for Frederica. Obviously, as a former member of the party and the widow of the founder Huey P. Newton, this film and this, this project really strikes a particular chord for your personal experience um, in living through this, this history. So what was the importance, is the importance of the film, both as a historical record and specifically at this moment in history for you? Thank you so much. You know, I wanted to echo and thank you, Hoda, for your words. Um, the history of the Black Panther Party was, like you said, misrepresented, maligned, denigrated, disparaged, and erased. And this film set an accurate historical record of what the Black Panther Party stood on, the principles that the party did, the work that we did in the community, the love for the community, and we need more. So it was, it was, I, I, I can't tell you how emotionally impacted I was after I saw the film. I, I'll just tell you a little personal story. We were <clears throat> given, I was given an opportunity to screen the film and I was in the, we're having a sculpture created of the bust of Dr. Huey P. Newton. And I was at the sculptor studio when I could access the film. So I was actually looking at it on my, on my iPhone. And there came, I think it was after Chairman Fred was shot where I was so moved, I was moved to tears and I had to dial up Mother Akua and just sobbed. And we just sobbed together. We sobbed because finally the world could see what the Black Panther Party was up against. This man was a 21 year old man child who was murdered um, because of the work that he was doing, which was based on pure love. There was nothing but love. And, um, you know, my own, my own experience in the party was so unlike what I read in the newspapers, like we're talking about two different organizations um, behind the disgusting COINTELPRO war against the party. There were people who were young people, teenagers, adults, young adults, even mature adults who were willing to lay down their lives every day just based on the love of their community. They, um, people left their, their families um, and people made supreme sacrifices just out of pure love. Every day we, we got up, we got up at the crack of dawn, we fed school children before they could go, go into school so they didn't have to go to school hungry. We worked in, a, we had a clothing factory so that people could get clothed. We had a school so that pe kids could get taught. And at night we, we were either <laughs> making sure that the Bl Black Panther Party newspaper was, um, was printed and then sent out. So it was nonstop work and all of it was volunteer. All of it was based on love. So Shaka and Ryan did an amazing job of telling the story. I couldn't be any more proud of the work that participant did and continues to do. 
um, the talent just brought it to life in such a powerful way. And, you know, the Dr. Huey P. Newton Foundation is honored to be a part of this. So I just want to thank you for the work that you did. Thank you for the work that you continue to do and to inspire people to tell the truth. We're about truth telling that finally on a national stage, this story is told in a way that it's never been told. So I... I hope I answered your question. Thank you, Frederica. You I get pretty emotional about this. No, thank you. And I think it's so important to just bring, to ground us in the very real reality that people lost their loved ones, people lost their childhoods, and all in the fight for Black liberation. And I think a core part of our campaign was to obviously highlight you and highlight Chairman Hampton Jr. and Mother Akua and other folks who were so personally impacted and made those sacrifices on the behalf of the community. So I think that that's so important for us to just like ground this conversation in. And I also think it's important to note that, as you mentioned, these are living legacies that obviously are not that long ago. Chairman Hampton was a 21 year old. He would, his birthday actually just passed. He would be turning 73 this year. And so I think it's really important just to draw that connection between the then and now that this is not that long ago and that the work is still continuing today. And that's why we are so proud to partner with all of you um, around this amazing film and this campaign. So I think one part of the partnership, obviously, between uh, participant and the foundation is really just being trying to amplify all of the amazing work that you're doing in Oakland and beyond. So can you share a little bit more about the mission of the foundation itself um, and what you have planned for the upcoming 55th anniversary of the founding of the Black Panther Party? Absolutely, and thanks for asking. Well, the foundation, the Black, the Dr. Huey P. Newton Foundation was founded 26 years ago. It doesn't seem like it's been so long. I mean that long, but it's 26 years ago. I co-founded the foundation with uh, David Hilliard, who was a former chief of staff of the Black Panther Party. And our mission was to promote and promulgate the um, actual history. And we're doing it through visual history and storytelling is now our central mission. We, um, during February, this past February, we were able to rename the street where Huey took his last breath to uh, Dr. Huey P. Newton Way. This was not done without amazing community involvement. And actually they've now, the community has now embraced that area and renamed it a sacred space. So there've been um, rallies around prison rights and um, uh, police violence on that street. And it's, it's, it's kind of blessed by the community. Um, since, that la since last year, we've been working on a permanent art piece. Um, there's, I'm sorry, let me back up just a little bit at that same space where uh, the street name is, we've created a, I haven't created it, Dana King, the sculptor has created a bronze bust that will be placed on October 24th, which will be the 55th anniversary of the, the um, celebration of the beginning of the Black Panther Party. And on October 24th, we'll be placing, we'll be unveiling that bust. Um, since last October, we've been, well, since last year, we've been working on a permanent art piece uh, to commemorate the legacy of the Black Panther Party, not an individual. And we want that prominently placed. Um, we're getting a groundswell of support from the Oakland City Council and elected officials. And we're, um, we're, we're working hard at that. We're working with the National Park, the National Park Conservation Association to create a national park right here in Oakland to commit, it could be one, it could be one of the largest national parks in existence because it will be of scattered sites. We've gotten a buy-in from neighboring cities, Richmond, San Francisco, and Berkeley. And as you know, there were Black Panther Party offices in 46 different cities. So this thing could span across the country. Um, we're working with, to, we'll then have a museum, which was in national park language is called a visitor center. And we also have a project with um, digitizing and indexing the newspapers. The Black Panther Party newspapers was in publication for 13 years. You talk about education and curriculum. We wanna make sure that that information is accessible to everyone. All of the history of the Black Panther Party is right there in, those, in that treasure trove, um, the Black Panther Party newspaper. So we're working to get that digitized and indexed. 
we're creating a curriculum to, as you say, to make sure that um, these kids are taught the accurate history of the Black Panther Party from elementary school through through college. Um, we've also creating a podcast and a book, and we're looking for and identifying and instituting projects and programs that will enable communities to understand the true history of the Black Panther Party. So we're busy. It we're sounds busy. like it. <laughs> Let me take a breath just with this whole list. So yeah, this is our work to, to, to promote and interpret and promulgate the history of the Black Panther Party. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, and obviously our partnership will continue beyond even this, this film and project. So we'll be excited to continue to share the work that you're all doing. Um, I actually think this is a perfect segue to talk a little bit to Marshall um, as well. Marshall, as the executive director of the MAFA Redemption Project, your work is one of the best modern day examples of exactly what Frederica was talking about, the Panthers having done um, through their legacy of carrying on their commitment to community-based support, especially in Chicago. So my question to you is, how did Chairman Hampton's legacy impact the activism work being done in the city and what aspects of his message have most resonated with you and may have also inspired your work today? Thank you, Rosalina. And it's a pleasure to be on this august panel with Hoda, good to see you again. And of course, Ms. Newton, Dr. Lazu, I'm honored. Uh, Chairman Fred's message, his life was his message, essentially. And that message was uh, rooted in love for Black humanity. But it didn't stop there. Of course, he was the original thinker for the uh, Rainbow Coalition, right? And so revolutionary politics, not just in this country, but globally. So this was at, at 21. This uh, was a broad thinker. But as Hoda mentioned, I think it's important to place his legacy, his living legacy on the continuum for black liberation in this country. And so the antecedents, of course, Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, Martin King, these are, uh, and so many others, these are those who impacted Chairman Fred and there is really, when it comes to Chicago politics, revolutionary politics, there's really a beeline um, that we can trace from Chairman Fred's legacy and even his assassination to Harold Washington and Barack Obama. And we just explained that a little, a little bit. So after Chairman Fred was assassinated, his organizing was so vibrant and of course, across communities, across race and ethnicity, that generation actually voted out state's attorney Hanrahan, the one who had a hand in Chairman Fred's assassination. And it was that energy, that vibrancy, that, that revolutionary politics that propelled uh, the first black mayor of Chicago, Harold Washington. And of course, we know it was Harold Washington's legacy that inspired Barack Obama to make Chicago his home. And so Chairman Fred's legacy lives on even now. I mean, I'm in West Garfield Park on the west side of Chicago, one of the forgotten neighborhoods of Chicago, uh, one of the neighborhoods that Dr. King organized uh, when he was here in 66, and one of the neighborhoods that Chairman Fred organized. Uh, and in fact, a couple blocks from here, there is a huge mural of Chairman Fred right on the intersection of Madison and California. Uh, and I remember growing up listening to stories, my family, my aunts, my father, uh, just how, how impactful the image of the Black Panthers, the image of Chairman Fred was, the leather jackets, the Black Beret. I mean, they really put flesh on the, the words Black power. Uh, and I think uh, what happened with the movie, with this, this generation now, Black Lives Matter generation. So what's happening with the Black Lives Matter movement today, uh, of course, this is a national movement and a global movement. And uh, young leaders uh, that we call ourselves cultivating in this neighborhood, uh, those 18, 19, 20 year olds, those that have, that have been you know, kind of thrown away by the education system, other systems, the criminal justice system, uh, to mobilize these young people, uh, the model 
that Chairman Fred and his legacy gave us. There's the, the continuum continues, uh, so to speak. And so uh, I was warmed by the film. Uh, the film uh, showed us who we are and, and it showed us what the country has done. I mean, imagine if, if Chairman Fred would have lived his life out, you know, this, this neighborhood probably wouldn't be as dilapidated as, as it is now. Uh, but still, his spirit lives on. And so um, that's what kind of encourages us to do the work that we do. So can you share a little bit more about the Mall for Redemption Project, how it came to be, and what the mission of the organization is now? Sure. So the word Ma'afa is Swahili, uh, and it means the great disaster, the great calamity, or catastrophe. Historically, it's been used to talk about uh, the systems of oppression that have been designed to um, degrade, dehumanize, and destroy Black humanity. And so the redemption of the Ma'afa is essentially investing in those who are most vulnerable in neighborhoods like this. Uh, and so again, we, we call ourselves uh, um, recruiting high risk individuals, those who are prone to be victims or perpetrators of gun violence in Chicago, uh, and basically uh, educating them so that, they can, so that they can know who they are, uh, so that they can know who Chairman Fred was, and so that they can uh, see themselves differently, and so that they can see themselves as leaders. And so it's both direct service, community development and community organizing. I think it's incredibly profound to ground your work in redemption and rehabilitation of black men in that context and to recognize the inextricable impact of generations of trauma. And so I think one of the reasons we were so, so excited to be able to partner with you, especially in incorporating the education guide um, through that work is just to make sure that we ground even the film in that same history to make sure that we are obviously giving as many resources to communities of color, particularly black men um, in these communities who obviously have been personally impacted by the long legacy of state sanctioned violence, particularly in Chicago and the ways in which it's impacted the community today. So thank you so much um, for continuing to do this work and we're excited to continue our partnership as well. Um, Dr. Jackie, so this history that Marshall and Frederica both talked about, especially the concept of the Rainbow Coalition, is obviously largely left out of our education. So I'm wondering from your perspective, perspective, what educators can do to ensure that a more inclusive, nuanced history of this story is taught? Thank you so much. Um, it's a great question. And um, I want to echo um, everyone's um, gratitude uh, to be able to uh, be a part of this group again um, and having these conversations and working on these initiatives. And I do have something to say about the role of educators, but I want to kind of begin by um, actually reflecting on us as scholars. Um, those of uh, so that the other part of our lives as educators is, of course, our role as scholars and, and, and intellectuals and public intellectuals to a degree. Um, powers that be and hege hegemony um, in this world, in this country and in this world have relied heavily on a rampant individualism, um, an individualism that um, also relies on the policing and the definition of what is legitimate knowledge and what is legitimate knowledge production. And so I would begin by really urging those of us who really see ourselves as scholars to really question um, how that, that has been limited um, and why that has been limited. And so that projects like these and collaborations like these should be given the same amount of value um, as something in print, for example. And this is, I'm getting into the nuances of academia, but I think it's really important um, because this is the type of work that we should be supporting, right? That higher education should be supporting. These are the types of collaborations that really all of the systems that are so influential in this country should be supporting. Um, and I think that that's important because um, 
we should be farther along. We should be farther along in our educational system. We sh this shouldn't be the first time that we're talking about this history, um, but it is. And so we have an opportunity every time that a project, project like this emerges, we have an opportunity to really put our money where, the, where our mouths um, are and, and to really give value to these types of, of projects. Um, but I would say as educators, certainly, I think that we need to pay attention to the needs and capacities of everyone involved in learning, um, which is everyone. Um, and of course, every place is a context for learning, but um, in formal educational spaces, we have to be mindful and intentional about the lessons that we actually extract from the Rainbow Coalition. For example, the liberatory educational goals, the transnationalism, the solidarity, coalition politics, um, but that are relevant to these times um, along the lines of what you, what you offer, Marshall, the idea of continuing to look to the past for lessons, especially around social change, is only really useful if we're able to understand the direction of change in the present. Um, today's organizers, uh, for example, are asking us to begin with intersectionality, to understand and hold space for the depth of identities. Um, black and brown uh, solidarity work, for example, is still critical, but really only gets us halfway there at best. We have to understand racial dynamics, racism and racial pride among this gigantic invention of, you know, what we call Latinidad, for example, um, gender and sexuality politics, all of it matters. Um, and as educators, we have to hold space um, for that to begin with. Um, I came to this collaboration as a scholar of social movements, um, especially Puerto Rican and Latino militant movements. I spent 20 years collecting the history and building the archives of the Young Lords, um, which is a third of the Rainbow Coalition, not necessarily as a Black Panther Party scholar, of which there are many brilliant ones. Um, I wouldn't allow myself to participate in these conversations um, about any of it without knowledge to compare. Um, I had to learn, um, I had to speak with and study Black radical thought. I know our history as a people and our struggle for change would be dishonest without the, that knowledge and that understanding. I think you made a really important distinction that I actually don't know if we've ever talked about before um, in the connection or the potential connection between the Rainbow Coalition and the way in which that operated, particularly in Chicago and particularly in this movement um, and the way in which we talk about intersectionality today and how organizers today want us to start with intersectionality as a founding principle. Can you talk about that a little bit more? I would just love to hear, I guess, your perspective on where the, that connection really became solidified or if you see a direct connection between the way in which the Panthers and particularly Chairman Hampton organized in Chicago and how organizers today are sort of modeling that intersectional um, diverse approach. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, I, I remember during the 50th anniversary of the Young Lords, which we celebrated um, a couple of years ago um, at DePaul, we brought in um, several of um, the elders of the movement. Um, and um, I remember someone saying um, at some point during one of the, the keynote um, uh, speeches that, um, there was a little bit of frustration about this concept of intersectionality because um, it's a new word, it's being put forth as if it were a new concept, but really the core of the Black Panther Party, of the coalition politics of the, of the Rainbow Coalition, really that's that was intersectionality. And if anything, we're moving from there and evolving from there. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with this idea of internationalization, of a transnational perspective. The fact that we understood that um, our liberatory um, initiatives and goals here were dependent on the liberation of people all across the world. Like that was that was found that was fundamental to the philosophy of the Black Panther Party. And as local as these movements were, as much as the Black Panthers in Chicago and the Young Lords in Chicago and the Young Patriots in Chicago were concerned about this, the community based. Um, really, it was neighborhood based almost in Chicago neighborhood based. Um, needs and capacities that needed that needed to be leveraged by them and others to be able to really create a more 
a, a more just society. Um, the vision wasn't just about that neighborhood. It wasn't just about that block. It wasn't just limited to that community. Um, they understood that that change had to happen and had to be experienced at the at the individual level, but that the goals were really to impact a changed society. Um, so that with each step, with each, each decision, with each program they launched, they were thinking about the people at the local level, but really understood that 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 those those initiatives needed to be multiplied. They needed to be extended to other poor people, to people of color, to people um, across the world. In the third world, for example, um, the so-called third world at the time, right? Third world politics emerged were really influential to these philosophies as well. So just this understanding that um, that the that that while change happens at the individual level, um, the the collective um, was critical to be able to. Um, see some significant change. Um, change is not about individual change. Uh, change is about collectivity, and, and they knew that. Um, that continues today, um, and we've expanded that notion. We've ex ex expanded the notion of who it is that we're fighting for um, so that we don't forget to name someone, right? Um, and that that's what's so impressive about young organizers is that you can't really come to these social movements without having you know a true consciousness and true intentionality about um, the multiplicity of identity you know whether it's sexual identity whether it's gender politics whether it's you know um, race um, ethnicity all of it matters. That's right. And I think, as you mentioned, we are obviously seeing the impacts of that today in today's form of organizing. There's no universe um, now, especially with social media, where we're not intimately aware of what's going on in Africa and parts of Europe um, and Israel, et cetera. So it's really exciting to be able to, to hear you share this history and know that we are finally starting to connect the dots and hopefully um, with more young organizers able to get to a more um, international form of liberation. My next question for you is obviously, um, I, I really liked the point that you made about as a scholar that it's really important to treat different forms of education and different forms of truth um, equally, despite it maybe not having, you know, having peer reviewed scholarship or citation and just really recognizing that there's value in community based work. Um, education. So from your perspective, obviously, we are a film company, and this is something that we are really trying to do through our impact campaign. So from your POV, what do you think about the role of film and entertainment in education? What more can film companies and other storytellers do to educate folks um, in different and creative ways? Well, you said it, and you could say it louder for the people in the back, but this is an exceptional example of what has to be done. Um, Expressive culture is so important and influential um, in this country, especially it's our biggest export. Um, but we've too often and for too long worked in silos or worked with the usual suspects, the same stories, the same sources, the same networks, um, thinking outside of the box and inviting diverse funds of knowledge to get at the untold stories and working with communities and individuals who've lived um, and know the stories and um, and, and to be fearless, um, to be fearless, to be more fearless. Don't wait for subjects to be popular and safe to tackle it. Um, of course, films rely on various levels of support to happen. Um, so the same advice has to go to funders then, right? Funders, producers, film companies, and everyone involved in bringing these stories to the screen. Um, it has to begin somewhere. Someone has to be fearless. And um, you know, a recognition of this is a critical moment, in film, right? Um, we're in crisis mode as a society, and we understand that it's had a huge impact on the arts um, as well and expressive culture in general. Um, and so um, this is this is an important moment of reflection for all of us, including that industry, and um, a perfect time to think about what has already been done and what still needs to be done. Right. And I think you sort of got to this. Could you speak a little bit more about how filmmakers can con continue to support meaningful narrative change around historical moments? I think Judas is a good example, a very on the nose example of trying to suss out more of the actual facts behind a relatively not well known aspect of the Panthers history. But in what ways can filmmakers do the same justice to other important historical moments, particularly for communities of color who haven't been able to tell their stories on the big screen? 
Yeah, I mean, again, I would say that um, it's really important to be able to, um, you know, delve, delve deeply into these stories. I can think of about, I mean, I, I, was, ex I was so excited to see this film. Um, I feel, I felt a personal, I felt like it was my story. I'm not even from Chicago originally. I've been here almost 20 years, so I kind of feel like a Chicagoan, but I don't say it out loud because Chicagoans won't let me yet. Uh, at some point I might be able to say it, but you know, Chicago is like a big neighborhood. Like it's a big gigantic neighborhood in some ways. And, um, in other ways, it's a, very, you know, extremely fractioned city, right? Big city. Um, you kind of get both, right? You get a sense of like a cohesiveness, um, and, but then you also have like just this mosaic of stories and perspectives, um, you know, on, on everything, right? Um, you can probably count about, you can probably tell about 10 different um, versions of the story of Fred Hampton and, and, and the Black Panther Party in Chicago um, in one neighborhood alone. Um, I think that that it, we we can't give up on stories, right? We can't give up on um, telling um, telling stories because we told one perspective, you know. So, for example, um, like I was saying, when I when I saw this film, um, immediately I started thinking about the things that you know. Um, were left out, right? The things that were still that still could be told that are that make really in interesting films, right? Um, of course, as a young lord scholar, for example, I thought to myself, "Oh my God, the young lord film has to come out. <laughs> it has to happen um, because that's a fascinating story, and it was so beautiful to be able to see it on screen, like um, alluded to." Um, but the expansion of that story, like the real understanding of that story, um, would be as magnanimous as it felt to see Fred Hampton on screen um, to Puerto Rican people, for example, right? Because that was our gateway to the civil rights movement, right? That was kind of our place in the US civil rights movement. So, um, so really, I mean, filmmakers have to understand the impact that these images and these stories have on communities um, and, um, and, and take those risks. Thank you. That's exactly what we're trying to do at Participant. And so it's great to sort of hear your perspective on that in particular, because it's something that we're really excited about to see in some of our future projects, which hopefully we'll be able to share with folks um, by this fall. So everyone, please look out for, for new announcements about some of the films that will definitely um, fall into this category. I wish I could tell you more, but not yet. <laughs> um, so I have a couple of questions for all of you. Um, the first is obviously with the situation our country is currently in between COVID and the crises it has fomented. What do you think we could all learn from the Panthers community programs and activism? And I'll start with Frederica for this one. Thank you. You know, I, as a young person in the Black Panther Party, we never waited for anybody to give us permission to do anything. If we saw a need in the community, we just filled it. We saw that children were dying of lead poisoning. Kids were getting really, really sick. Um, lead is, is, is sweet and it's in the paint. So children were peeling the paint off of the walls and reaching from their cribs and you know they're probably hungry and eating the paint and getting really ill and some were dying. So we started doing lead poisoning testing. Kids were getting, people had sickle cell and were dying. There was, there was no research, there was no work being done in the community around making sure that people were screened for sickle cell and treated. We did that. We saw people were hungry, we fed them. They, were, we were, they needed clothing, we created a clothing factory. They needed shoes, we worked in a shoe factory in Chinatown. So we never waited around for anyone to give us permission or even the resources if we, I remember, there was a store in Berkeley that's now pretty expansive. Um, they used to give us food for the breakfast program. It was like a corner store. So we'd seek out um, who, whoever could contribute on whatever level. Um, we worked in coalition, as Dr. Lazu said, with um, Brown and Asian community. Huey took a lot of flack for his article on supporting the gay movement. and. Um, 
And, and she's so right about the term intersectionality. When I first started hearing it, I said, wait a minute, I think this is what we used to do and it wasn't called that. <laughs> um, and in terms of um, globalism, Huey called it, it was a long word, intercommunalism. So none of these things are new, but we, I just would have to say that as people see the deterioration in their communities, don't wait for somebody to give them permission. Um, go out and do what you can kind of get, rooted where you are and um, do the work in the community like we did. So I'd, I, I, I know that's, I mean, that's the work that we did. We just, we, we, we scratched along. If we didn't have a lot of food to feed them, we fed what we could. And if we didn't, um, we organized the community, the community did not, I think there was a period of time where the where the Black Panther Party kind of defected from the Black community when we um, kind of disparaged the church and started using Kurtz, going to the churches and cursing. And uh, we finally saw through our analysis of self-criticism that that was not the way to go. So when we saw ourselves defecting from the community, we just kind of took a look at what we were doing and, and reset. And so we learned that, um, we just had to, if there was a need in the community, as you can look around, look out my window and I, I, I can see the need right where I'm sitting, that that's just the work that we did. And um, there was, you know, the, the conditions are not unlike they were then currently. Right. And Marshall, how about for you and the work you're doing with the Manatha Redemption Project, in what ways has obviously the pandemic we're living through um, expanded or adjusted some of the work that you typically do in Chicago? Well, of course, the, the pandemic lifted the veil off of so much um, the ills with our um, healthcare system. For instance, of course, Black and Brown folk were disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And I think what Ms. Newton described is a kind of grassroots uh, philanthropy that uh, created a model that we need to return to. Why? Because what exists now is uh, a kind of social service industrial complex. And by that, I mean, you know, folks come into neighborhoods like this uh, with a paternalistic vision of what they believe works when the reality is that they need to invest in community-based organizations that are already doing the work um, because the, the ivory tower approach has never worked and it won't work. And I think what the Black Panther Party showed us uh, is that we need to invest in uh, indigenous and neighborhood and grassroots organizing. And, uh, and I appreciate uh, what Ms. Newton shared uh, because it, it just reminds me of, uh, of how far we've come, but also how far we have, we have a lot of ways to go. Uh, so right now we're, we're working, uh, in our neighborhood, we're working to bring a federal, federally qualified health center to the neighborhood. Uh, I remember the scene in Jewish and the Black Messiah. Uh, I think it was one of the uh, penultimate scenes where Chairman Fred is uh, surrounded by, you know, friends and he's facing five years and they're trying to get him to flee the country. And he's like, you know what we can do in five years if we build a health clinic. That's the kind of revolutionary love that we need to return to. And I don't think um, uh, white saviorism and that paternalistic uh, vision of how to invest in black and brown neighborhoods will ever work. And so we need to lift up what's already been put before us. Exactly. And I, I think from the participant impact campaign perspective, that's been one of the main reasons we've been so happy to be able to partner with you all and Chairman Hampton Jr. to make sure that we're actually supporting the folks who are already doing the work, who have the local and community-based expertise, um, and really just make sure that we're amplifying to a national audience what you all are doing. And so I know from the impact campaign, another aspect of what obviously has changed in the pandemic is we're not on the ground with you all and able to physically you know, support um, in the ways in which we would love to, but obviously by trying to get as many folks as possible from a national perspective to know your stories and be able to support your organizations is a huge aspect of what we're so proud of. And I do wanna plug one thing um, that I know that Chairman Hampton Jr. would want me to flag, which is the Hampton House. And that's been a huge, huge aspect 
of what our campaign has really been um, fighting to support. And most recently, uh, we actually announced a petition in partnership with the Save the Hampton House initiative, which is to try to um, get the Hampton House recognized as a historical landmark in the city of Maywood, which would grant it, of course, um, more of a protective status and help continue the work that Chairman Hampton Jr. and the Black Panther Party Cubs are continuing to do in Chicago to support um, the youth there. So wanted to plug that as well as something that obviously the campaign is also very proud of. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next question because we only have a few minutes left and we could talk about all of this forever. Um, but my next question is basically a little bit of a segue from COVID-19, but also to the injustices, obviously, in the social unrest that we've seen over the course of the last year since the murder of George Floyd. People are more primed than ever, arguably, to be aware of a range of social issues, which, of course, through film and through the work that we're doing today is, is sort of what we're trying to continue the drumbeat on. So, Hoda, my question for you is, how can we use this momentum to advance social issues through entertainment and impact work? And what are some of the upcoming aspects of this work that participants excited to continue? I think it's such a great question. And I think you framed it so beautifully in that audiences and folks are really primed um, to at least be aware. And I think that's like the lowest baseline that we can expect. Um, but I, I feel like it's an opportunity and an entry point to take people from being aware, using pop culture, using film, using narrative stories, community storytelling, to take folks from being aware to being active participants. And so whether that's leading in their specific communities to being visionary leaders and thinking beyond communities and thinking how to help ensure that resources are brought to everyone, right? Not just their local communities, um, but thinking about how we're all connected, um, you know, in the spirit of the way that Black Panthers thought uh, in a transnational approach, the presence, the respect and the influence that Black Panthers had, not just here in America, but in South America in North Africa, all over the world. Um, I think we can use these stories to really amplify and have young activists and young leaders see themselves in these living legacies um, to ensure that the work continues. And, you know, I, I feel like the gift that, that we've been given with this film, Judas and the Black Messiah, we are now uh, able to bring together a new audience, a new community of people who can no longer sit on the sidelines in the face of injustice, who are witnessing these injustices, but also want to play an active role in correcting them and ensuring that it doesn't happen again, in reimagining what a future can look like, where we talk about a rainbow coalition, you know, and, and that's the norm. We talk about intersectionality and that's something that's taught in pre-K even, right? That students and, and people all over the world understand that we're so connected and that all of our, um, for anyone to thrive, we want we want to ensure that everyone is thriving, right? So um, I think that we have a real opportunity, not just with Judas and the Black Messiah, but um, with these stories that are being told. Um, uh, to ensure that we are really seeing change, that we're not just talking about it, but we're we're doing something about it. Exactly. And Dr. Jackie, my follow-up for you on that is, how can we ensure that this reimagination of a future is also incorporated in education and also in the research that scholars like yourself are doing as well? Well, first of all, I want to um, second the, the plug for the Hampton House um, work that's being done and then um, also shout out the New Era Young Lords, which is this group of young people that um, are also, you know, collaborating on that initiative and sort of showing up for it um, and have emerged in the last year. Um, as um, an extension, almost like a, you know, Black Panther Cubs or New Black Panther Party type movement um, based around the philosophies and principles of the Young Lords, of course. Um, and it's that continuity, right? It's that continuity, it's that vision of looking, looking back to in order to move forward that I think is so critical um, to these types of conversations, right? Not to sort of abandon those lessons of the past, but to really continue to try to understand them. Um, 
in terms of what education, you know, what, what we can do as, as educators, as, as an educational system, um, you know, it's been said already, but I think it bears um, repeating um, that we have to learn about and support the work of people that are working toward a better society and not be afraid of what um, somehow is still perceived as radical change. Um, equity, equity, that's not radical, <laughs> except in our society, right? So to really understand that, um, you know, pushing the boundaries is okay, um, demanding more from the industries that influence our way of thinking, um, whether it's Hollywood or the university, both hold an enormous amount of influence and wealth um, and should be accountable for um, their, our, our direct and indirect influence on, on this society. Thank you. Um, my last question for Frederica is, as we approach the 55th anniversary of the founding of the Black Panther Party, what can we all do to amplify the legacies and positive contributions of the party and specifically knowing that the Dr. Huey P. Newton Foundation is planning a big event um, in Oakland for that day. Please tell us and the audience what we should all be doing um, to make sure that we can support the work that you're all doing. Thank you so much. Yes, that whole weekend will be on, on not just a celebration, but education around and coming together of all of the surviving uh, Black Panther Party members and Cubs and community activists and members who were impacted by the Black Panther Party. So there'll be a whole weekend full of seminars, um, um, breaking bread together, and it will end on Sunday with the unveiling of this bronze bust. It's a beautiful bust on the corner of Mandela Parkway and Dr. Huey P. Newton Way. And um, we just welcome anybody that wants to come out uh, and to celebrate it. We're hoping that it'll be streamed as well. And um, so just to continue to support the legacy of the Black Panther Party through the work that the Dr. Huey P. Newton Foundation is doing. You can visit our website. We're on Instagram. We're, 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 we're young at heart. So we're, we're, we're everywhere. Uh, yeah, we're everywhere. So yeah, please come and um, celebrate and support the work that, that we continue to do here to amplify and promote this legacy. So thank you. Course. And Marshall, how can we and the audience continue to support the work that the Mafia Redemption Project is doing? Sure. Uh, you can visit our website, maafa, M A A F A, Chicago.org, and support us and learn about us. Um, wanted to piggyback on something Dr. Lazu said really quickly. She alluded to reaching back into the past, learning from it in order to create a better future. And uh, in the African American community, we consider that. Sankofa, which is of course a, uh, it's a philosophical approach, uh, but it's also a spiritual approach. It, it, it grounds us in who we are. And of course uh, I am uh, because we are is the ethos that, that grounds our approach to educating ourselves, but also uh, liberating ourselves. Thank you so much, Marshall. And Dr. Jackie, how can we continue to support the scholarship that you do and also the work of educators? Well, I want to invite everyone, of course, to visit the archives at the Paul that we have um, worked for the last 20 years to build the history and um, artifacts of the Young Lords um, organization, which was founded in Chicago um, in the Lincoln Park community, which is where our main campus undergraduate campus is at the Paul University. Um, so it is part of our special collections and it does include um, a lot of the history of the Black Panther Party, the Rainbow Coalition. So it's a great place for anyone to come and start to learn about um, this, this important movement. And um, yes, continue to look into the work of um, these other organizations that were um, so dependent upon and so coexistent with um, each other. Um, in terms of um, their place in history and their place in, in, in building, um, you know, our, our collective history in Chicago, um, center Chicago and center these other spaces that have been sort of left out of these narratives. Um, think outside the box in terms of where you understand communities to exist um, so that you can find those, those stories. Um, yeah. Thank you. And Hoda, how can folks continue to support the participant impact campaign as well as the work of Chairman Hampton and the Hampton House. 
Uh, well, I would invite everyone to visit our website at liveforthepeople.com. And for those who are so inclined to uh, be public supporters um, for saving the Hampton House and ensuring that the Hampton House uh, becomes a landmark site in Chicago, I'd invite you to go to savethehamptonhouse.org, sign the petition, write a little comment. We're going to be submitting all those materials. It's incredibly important for everyone to be involved. We just want to show the breadth and depth of the importance and the love that people have for the Hampton House and ensuring that we um, can get it to be protected by the city of Maywood and that um, God willing, when the pandemic is over, we can all go and visit because I know that Chairman Hampton um, and Mother Akua have incredible plans for it, including for it to become a museum. Thank you so much. Um, that concludes our discussion as well as the first day of the Peace Studio Summit. Thank you all for tuning in and please join us again tomorrow for another jam packed day. We'll be back at 10 a.m. Eastern time for Indigenous Healing Practices, Hope, Knowledge and Resilience. Thank you again to our lovely panelists and we hope you have a great day.